At the dawn of 2787, the Doomsday Clock was at one minute to midnight. The successor states had declared war on each other. All travel and interstate commerce had ground to a halt. The people of the Inner Sphere were frozen in terror, waiting to see where the first strike would land. As yet, no one had made a move, but behind the scenes, each nation was scrambling to be the first to launch a knockout blow before they themselves were attacked. While the last of the successor lords were claiming rulership of the Star League, Jerome Blake arrived on Tharkad to meet with the Archon. He explained to her his desire to see Comstar recognised as a neutral party. In return, he would continue to operate the HBG network within the Commonwealth, allowing them to pass messages between themselves and to neighbouring states. Seizing the facilities was always an option available to Jennifer Steiner. She, like each of her rivals, had in her navy a small number of individuals who were qualified to operate the exceedingly rare mobile HPGs, a technology that had now all but vanished along with the rest of the SLDF. But it would take time to train a whole new workforce to take over the hyperpulse generators, time which she could scarcely afford to lose at this crucial hour. Having experienced firsthand the disruption caused by the sudden loss of communications following the Amaris coup, Jennifer was amenable to Blake's suggestion, but was wary that she would be at a disadvantage if the other state lords refused. Blake happily informed her that she was the last to sign the agreement, after which Steiner gladly consented. Jerome Blake was lying, however. The Archon was the first he had met with. He was banking on the growing hostility preventing the states from conferring with each other on his activities. Each successor lord believed that they would soon be ruler over all so the activities of the lowly Minister of Communications were of little interest to them. By the time he returned to Terra early the next year, Blake had managed to get all five to sign the Communications Protocol of 2787, formally recognising HPGs as sovereign territory, acknowledging their neutrality and agreeing to make all further payments to Comstar using their own sea bills. The Draconis Combine was still slowly chipping away at the Terran hegemony, taking the planet Stenabal Jedi and Styx in the first weeks of January, cutting off the belligerent Inglesmond from its allies. They quickly seized the worlds of Nirasaki and Quinton soon after. Later in the year, they struck at the LTV aerospace facility orbiting Inglesmond's moon, destroying the few warships the fledgling alliance had. The coordinator's main focus was elsewhere, however, as they continued to amass forces on their border, ready to strike at their more powerful neighbour. With the Combine seemingly focused elsewhere in the Terran hegemony and Lyran Commonwealth, the AFFS continued its preparations for a strike at the Chesterton Commonality. Over 50 regiments had been transferred to staging posts along the border, their initial list of targets including key Capellan industrial worlds. To ensure that Curita didn't launch any opportunistic land grabs once the campaign was underway, Davian ordered a strike of his own against the planet David. The raid was a great success for the AFFS. The Curitan commander only seemed able to mobilise half of the garrison, allowing the raiders time to seize significant quantities of munitions and spare parts before withdrawing. Going completely unnoticed were the five other regiments on world. The Free World League's intelligence agency, SAFE, was reporting to the Captain General that Curita was days away from launching a major invasion of the Lyran Commonwealth. Furthermore, the Archon seemed to have serious concerns about a new secret army emerging from the former Rimwell's Republic, leaving the nation besieged on all sides. With the LCAF ordered into defensive positions, Maddock felt comfortable turning his attention towards softer targets on their spinward flank. In late February, a quarter of the massive Marek Militia Brigade was moved to the border of the Sarna Commonality as well as almost 40 conventional regiments and the FWLN 2nd Fleet. Their invasion would take aim at the commonality capital, right in the heart of the Confederation. It would begin with a simultaneous assault on Harsfeld, Rahman, Second Chance and Vanra. The first two were secured quickly, facing only minimal resistance from the planetary militia. The Raman Lancers were not on well to defend their home planet, instead garrisoned on the neighbouring Second Chance, where they came face to face with a trio of FWLM regiments. The first shots were fired in the distant reaches of the system, 
as two patrolling vessels of the Sarna Commonality Fleet moved to engage the escorting trio of Freewell's warships. First kill went to the CCS Solstice, her enormous mass driver gutting one of the lead destroyers in a single shot. The surviving Marek vessels had the advantage after they closed range and quickly overcame the defenders, destroying the larger Capellan battleship using nuclear missiles. Solstice attempted to retaliate with its own arsenal, but only destroyed a handful of dropships before exploding herself. The Confederation had now also learned that weapons of mass destruction were fair game in this new succession war. As the FWLS Saranda entered orbit, they saw heavy activity at the spaceports below. It wasn't clear if the vessels about to depart were military, but the threat that dropships and aerospace fighters carrying nuclear ordnance posed was too great a risk to wait to find out. They promptly unleashed devastating orbital fire on the facilities, obliterating the fleeing civilian government within. With their loss, and the realization that the planetary governors were prepared to abandon them, the Raman Lancers began to fall apart. They begrudgingly accepted General Rosenkov's call to surrender an hour later. The defenders on Vanda, despite being outnumbered 3 to 1, had the home field advantage as they had been stationed on world for almost 25 years. Their aerospace fighters were able to intercept and shoot down one of the approaching overlords which crashed into the deep wilderness, forcing the rest of the regiment to redeploy to assist their comrades. The Capellans got there first, however, killing the few survivors and then ambushing the relief force. Only one battalion made it out of the forest. The battle for the capital city proved a costly affair. The charges would not give an inch, and eventually the invaders used orbital fire to level their positions. Half of Utrecht was destroyed in the bombardment, as were the remaining CCAF. Opposition on second chance had been lighter than expected as the Capellans had only just reassigned one of the regiments in garrison to seize the Terran hegemony system of Hall. To prevent Liao reinforcements from being dispatched to help the occupied systems, a raiding force was sent to Aldebaran, deep within the Tikhonov commonality. Nearby units hunkered down, anticipating other attacks. Kenyon Manik was an ambitious man and sound military strategist. He was never wasteful or reckless with his forces, earning the respect of his commanders. In due course, this talent would earn him the nickname The Eagle. Despite his main focus being the campaign against the Capellan Confederation, he never took his eye off his other neighbour. The League Central Coordination and Command Group saw a target of opportunity on their doorstep. The Bolson shipyards within the new Kyoto system were a major resupply and refit centre for the Lyran Navy. Destroying these facilities early would pay dividends in any future escalation between the two. On February 14th, they dispatched a trio of destroyer squadrons to the system, supported by two aerospace wings. Defending the facility was a squadron of corvettes, including two of the survivors from the Bolan campaign and an aerospace regiment of their own. The battle was fast and frenetic. The lighter Lyran warships were quickly overwhelmed, with almost a dozen destroyed in just 15 minutes. The engagement ended prematurely though, when Colonel Thompson piloted their damaged aerospace fighter into the Matic flagship's bridge, sending it on a collision trajectory of its own with the shipyards, after which both sides withdrew to lick their wounds. A second larger naval engagement followed just 10 days later on the Lyran's opposite border. The raid on Scondia the previous year had shown the LCAF to be incapable of stopping a determined assault. The Draconis Combine Admiralty formed a new 45 warship fleet, pairing them with six battle mech regiments and several more supporting units, tasked with the objective of pushing all the way to the provincial capital of Skye. The first step would be a return to Scondia, where this time they would conquer the world for the dragon. In the months leading up to the attack, the solitary mech regiment in garrison had been reinforced by two others, plus five warships and 20 escort dropships. While this meant it was one of the better defended worlds in the Commonwealth, it could not hope to match the approaching task force. Upon arrival at the system's nadir jump point, Pedersen quickly realised that things had gone horribly wrong. Since the attack on New Kyoto, the Lyra Navy had been pooling their warships in the region into a single fleet based out of Scondia 
now numbering some 50 Lyran warships and another 200 smaller vessels. Most of the fleet was in orbit over the planet itself, which gave the Taisho the opportunity to withdraw. Instead, he commanded all the ships under his command to form up into a cone and dove straight into the heart of the defences, punching a hole for the transports to reach Skondia. Van Hadden's warships were primarily anti-capital vessels, which meant despite their best efforts, they were only able to destroy around 20% of the smaller dropships before they entered orbit. Focusing on the transports also allowed the many carriers in the DCA fleet to launch their aerospace fighters, which inflicted huge losses on the Lyrans. By the end of March, two-thirds of the Commonwealth fleet had been destroyed, including the Admiral's flagship. The Curitans had lost half of their force by comparison. The ground campaign now swung even more in the Combine's favour as they were able to call down orbital fire on exposed Lyran positions. Nevertheless, they held out for two months before calling in the remaining naval support for extraction. Back in the Free World League, the Eagle was driving his force onwards. Hassad, Shea Pao, and Singhai were taken from the Capellans by his advancing Marik militia, but the primary target lay within another region of space. New Dallas was one of the strongest planets left to the Terran hegemony, and had become a provincial capital after the loss of Tyrfing. The planetary militia had fought Amaris tooth and nail, and were expected to be equally belligerent towards any successor state that approached. Three FWLM regiments entered the system on March 20th, and ran face first into the reformed New Dallas Rangers, equipped with Royal Tier battle mechs piloted by veterans of the Star League Civil War. The Marek militia was completely wiped out, and the Atrian Dragoons were on the back foot until they resorted to using their nuclear arsenal. 300,000 within Caddo City were vaporised in order to eliminate the pair of militia battalions in defence, after which the survivors surrendered. New Dallas was in Marek hands, its worth now all but useless. Within a month of the Draconis Combine making landfall on Scondia, Jennifer Steiner ordered a series of reprisal raids. She did not want to commit her military to an offensive against the Dragon, but she hoped that keeping the Coordinator off balance would reduce the number of attacks coming her way. There was no better way to achieve this than a strike on the capital itself. This dangerous assignment was given to Duke Graham Kalswa and his Tamar Tigers. Their transport for the mission was one of the few remaining Potemkin-class troop cruisers, with a full complement of 25 dropships. They expected an enormous naval presence, but they found only two smaller warships. The location of the DCA fleet was a mystery, but they had no time to consider it. Taking full advantage of their weakness, the Nightwind made a beeline for the colossal shipyards, the largest within the Combine and destroyed the facility while the Tigers made their descent. The defending mech regiments huddled around Imperial City, allowing the attackers to ride roughshod over the Aichi continent. Several major factories were destroyed before the Duke withdrew three days later. Minoru Hirita had been humiliated by how powerless he was to respond. The famous Black Pearl at the heart of the Draconis Combine had been desecrated. Worse was to follow at Dieron in April. The DCA had a warship squadron in orbit over the world, part of their ongoing invasion of the Terran hegemony. They were tasked with the defence of the Stellar Trek naval yard, the main objective for the Lyran raid. A half dozen Steiner warships appeared in system, unleashing two squadrons of nuclear-armed assault dropships to clear a path for them. The aging Aegis-class Selene was blown apart by their missiles, forcing the Essex destroyers to break off giving the Tharkad and Commonwealth-class cruisers a clear shot at the shipyard. Radstad was undergoing service and decoupled from the facility with most of her guns still offline and barely any crew aboard. She attempted to ram the largest battle cruiser, but was destroyed before making contact. Gallery and York now launched their nuclear payload at the facility, destroying another of the Draconis Combine's vital space docks. The four DCA destroyers regrouped, almost succeeding in destroying the Lyran flagship before they themselves were eliminated. Meanwhile, the raiding party was making landfall. They had their own objectives on the ground. This was the first outing for Colonel Raymond Hempstead's stealths. 
The Lyran Commonwealth had tremendous faith in his abilities, putting the mercenary commander in charge of the entire operation. The reason he had such a solid reputation was because his unit had acquitted themselves well during the Starleague Civil War, fighting for Amaris as the 23rd Republican Light Lancers. After four hours on the ground, it became clear that something had gone wrong in space. They had not received a single message from the four surviving cruisers. Ground operations were quickly wrapped up and the dropships departed. A brief search of their last known location turned up only wreckage fragments, forcing the raiders to withdraw to their jump ships. The fate of the warships remains a mystery, the answer perhaps lying somewhere in the debris field known as the junkyard, the detritus left from the space battle during Operation Chieftain. It's possible that the Lyran ships fell victim to something lurking in the radioactive debris. In the neighbouring system, the Curitans were again picking at the remains of the Terran hegemony. When they arrived at Saffel, however, they found it was defended by elements of the Blue Star Irregulars. The former soldiers of the Amaris Empire Armed Forces knew the location of a hidden AEAF cache and had raced ahead to secure it for the Federated Sons. Rather than engage them, the Tysar purposely diluted his strength by spreading them across the planet, then withdrew shortly after. This was exactly as warlord Jinjiro Kirita had ordered. Saffel was just one of a dozen minor skirmishes the AWFS had won against the Draconis Combine during 2787. Another came at Kaf, where a force sent to flank the Confederation and establish a link to Terra defeated a small force of CCAF and DCMS opponents, evening the score for the debacle on town. Several other hegemony systems were taken to broaden their control of that vital link. Fedson's military intelligence was receiving reports from one of their marshals that something big was going on just across the border, but the head of MI2 for the region had dismissed his concerns. John Davian was busy marshalling his forces for a strike at the Chesterton commonality and was not hearing anything that might worry him from the Draconis March. On May 1st, 2787, Jinjiro Kirita began the largest offensive campaign of the Succession Wars. Fifteen mech regiments and a further 55 conventional units stationed around Tanel moved simultaneously against the seven systems within the Kusser pocket. They struck so quickly that most worlds failed to alert the rest of the Federated Sons that they were under attack. The best AWFS units within the region had already been redeployed ahead of the planned Capellan offensive leaving only second-line regiments in garrison. The mercenaries on Marduk fled at their approach, while others stood and fought, not realizing that they were at the epicenter of a Curitan tsunami. The attack on the Paris Bulge was just the first of three DCMS task forces set to advance into Davian territory. Jinjiro had amassed over 50 battle mech regiments along the border, representing more than a third of the entire Draconis Combine mustard soldiery. Supporting them were 150 regiments of conventional forces. On May 4th, Jinjiro led a second attack into the Daha combat region, spearheaded by the First Sword of Light. At the same time, a third wave crashed into the Clovis combat region. On point was the Third Sword of Light, and with them was none other than the coordinator Minoru Kirita himself. Their main goal was the regional headquarters on Clovis. The Fed Sun's navy had only a trio of warships on hand to defend the system, while the Draconis Combine Admiralty assigned a squadron from their third fleet to clear a path for Minoru. Things concluded in space predictably, but it gave the three Davian armor regiments and the planet's own Clovis guards some vital time to reinforce their position. They were outnumbered five to one, but were nonetheless able to hold their ground during the first week. ISF agents have reported an additional two mech regiments somewhere on Weld, which caused the Kiritans to fight conservatively until they realized their mistake. Furthermore, the presence of the coordinator prevented them from doing anything as dishonorable as using weapons of mass destruction. The field marshal had been desperately calling for reinforcements throughout the attack, but the combine invasion was so absolute that near every other system in range was also under attack. Only a single vessel arrived from Kosa, but by this point, Simons could see the battle was lost. He ordered them to call off their landing while he would attempt to withdraw. While some of the survivors were able to escape, the field marshal was not among them, 
his dropship intercepted by Kiritan aerospace fighters and destroyed while leaving atmosphere. His death was a major blow to both coordination and morale in the region. It's often said that the decision not to attack the Lyran Commonwealth, as everyone had expected the Draconis Combine to do, was made by Minoru to comply with the tenets of Bushido, which he held in high esteem. Bushido says that a weak opponent, as how Steiner had proven themselves to be, should be given time to prepare themselves further, so that they might fight honourably. In truth, Jinjiro had long ago convinced his father to strike at the Federated Sons, and their actions along the Lyran border were simply part of an elaborate ruse, one that had successfully duped the rest of the Inner Sphere. Word of the invasion did not reach First Prince John Davian on Muskegon until the third week of May. He frantically dispatched orders to those units he could reach to withdraw from the Draconis March and establish a new defensive line at the edge of the Crucis March. Unfortunately, the provincial attitudes that plagued the AWS were preventing any sort of coordinated response. Some regiments would not abandon their homes and foolishly tried to hunker down and weather the storm. Others, who had only recently been moved to the Draconis border, up and fled the moment they received their orders. Federated Sun's losses were horrific during this first month, and the defensive line that the First Prince had hoped to establish was full of holes. The DCMS employed an unusual strategy to great effect during their advance. They would arrive in system, quickly destroy all communications facilities, naval assets, and any Fed Sun's troops in the open, and then promptly depart. They spent as little time on ground as possible before jumping to their next target. This left large pockets of resistance in their wake, but those troops had no means of leaving the system or coordinating an effective defense. In the subsequent months, less experienced second-line Curitan units would arrive to mop up what was left. The advance was happening so quickly that tracking exactly where the front line was became almost impossible, both for the AWFS commanders trying to organize a defense and for us historians attempting to follow along Centuries removed from the conflict, we can only make vague approximations as to how far Kirita had penetrated into the Federated Suns. By the end of the first month, the DCMS had made serious inroads into two of the Draconis March operational areas. Almost all of the Clovis combat region had been taken, most of Dahar and Robinson, and half a dozen systems within Fairfax. All this had been achieved with very few casualties. The only notable losses were the first and third Sword of Light, who had been at the forefront of several major battles. An elite corps of survivors would go on to form the new 6th and 8th Sword of Light regiments, adopting as their sigil the pillars of ivory and jade. The success of Jinjiro's campaign was so shocking that three mortal enemies, the Capellan Confederation, Free Wills League and Lyran Commonwealth, briefly contemplated signing a mutual non-aggression pact with the powerful Draconis Combine. Ultimately, Steiner had already lost too many worlds to allow it, and there was too much ill will between Liao and Marek for an alliance there. By comparison to the Kiritan onslaught, Kenya Marek's 50 regiment invasion of the Capellan Confederation was positively quaint. In May, they seized control of Old Kentucky without a fight after discovering the planetary garrison had fled before their approach. How Steiner was a constant irritant though, periodically probing the defenses of the Bolan Thumb. A raid on Roche turned into a full assault, one which cost the Bolan Defenders Brigade another of their units. Significant use of WMDs scarred the world to the point where the LCAF abandoned it soon after. Roche fell back into Marikans, but there was nothing of value left in the debris. The only other major action was when the Free Worlds League took Wyatt, a former Terran system that the Lyrans had seized a few years earlier. Despite being the first to declare war on each other, the Lyran League border remained one of the quietest during this early phase of the war. The Marik militia continued their advance in July, quickly seizing Shamdo and Fact. Wazen seemed as if it would fall just as easily. A pair of Marek militia regiments made landfall and took both the capital and spaceports without incident, but scouts then discovered the presence of the old Kentucky Lancers. They had dug in at one of the smaller cities, awaiting Holbright's approach. She instead ordered the firebombing of the city, 
wiping out half of the regiment and countless civilians within. Things played out in similar fashion on Kori. The unit sent to take the world were engaged by one of the CCAF's new regiments formed from SLDF remnants. They withdrew from the spaceport after a brief clash and set up positions within the capital city. An additional two companies of catapults bolstered their defense straight from the planet's mech factories. This prompted Colonel Gaines to call in orbital strikes, again demolishing large parts of the city. The survivors withdrew into the hills. With the exception of picking at the Terran hegemony bones, the Capellan Confederation armed forces had so far barely played a part in the First Succession War. The Mashkarovka had kept Barbara Liao informed of the growing Davian task force near Chesterton, and it had blinded her to the Marek invasion that came from the opposite direction. Now she sought to regain some of the initiative. At the risk of coming into conflict with a third successor state, the Capellan Chancellor gathered together a trio of Liao and Tikhonov lancers and tasked them with seizing Davian wells within the Clovis combat region before Kirita could organize an assault. She recognized that each realm would have Terra as one of its main targets for the war, and it was worth the risk to shut the Federated Sons out of any future battle for humanity's homeworld. By August, she had taken Angol, Rio, and Tybalt. While they prepared for their next jump, Barbara turned her attention towards dealing with the Eagle. The brutal tactics employed by the Marek militia colonels on Kori and Wazan had failed to eliminate the planetary garrisons, and now the survivors rose up in rebellion. Further back, the Grand Duchy of Orient had sent a pair of its regiments to garrison the New Worlds. The Hassad lancers struck at the newly arrived forces before they had settled into defensive positions. In September, the Marek militia assault force redeployed in an effort to stamp out the rebellion, but they proved particularly stubborn. The CCAF launched their follow-on attacks against another trio of worlds within the Clovis combat region the following month. By the end of November, Heen, New Florence, and Ronald had all been added to the Tikhonov commonality. That same month proved to be the last for the few remaining defenders on Kori and Wazan. Orient dispatched more garrison forces in December to defend the Free World's latest conquests and free up the Marek militia to continue towards Sana. Or at least, that was their plan until the Capella Navy ambushed their waiting jumpships. The League warships in orbit above the worlds attempted to move to their aid, but the distance was far too great. The Liao vessels now moved to intercept. Their victory was a decisive one. All seven Free Worlds League Navy ships were destroyed at the cost of only two from the Confederation, plus a third that lost all drive. This left eight FWLM regiments stranded deep within the Sana commonality at the mercy of the hostile naval vessels overhead. As the Inner Sphere entered December 2787, the first year of the Succession Wars was coming to a close. The brutality on display had shocked all involved. They hoped for a decisive victory. 238 years later, we're still waiting. And there we have it then guys, Armageddon has come to the Inner Sphere. This has been the first year of the Succession Wars, and no matter how bad things might have got already, they're about to get a lot worse. Over the last few episodes we've told the story from December to December, the first 12 months, but there is one final thing that I missed out in this episode. It happens right at the end, carries over into the new year, so that's why I'm going to include it as the opening to the next one. It is the first of many battles for Hesperus, uh, one of the most important planets in the Inner Sphere, and the Combine's going to have a crack at it. Speaking of the next episode, I think it might be the most somber one I have ever done. The scale of the carnage in the next year is difficult to get your head around. So once again, I've slowed things right down. We're gonna take another 30 minutes just to go through that one year, but that'll be the last time we take as long. Uh, you'll be relieved to know we're not gonna do 30 minutes for each year of the Succession Wars. Uh, as the various factions find that they can no longer sustain this early pace, uh, it starts to taper out. 
uh, and we'll be covering a longer length of time per chapter. We're looking to do probably somewhere in the region of 20-30 minutes per weekend. That might be two short chapters over Saturday, Sunday, or it might be just a single larger upload on the Saturday. Uh, I will let you know as things progress. If you don't want to wait and you want to support the channel, I do have a Patreon link in the description, as well as links to some of the people whose art and music I've used in these videos. The response to these videos so far has been pretty spectacular, I'm really pleased you're enjoying them, and hopefully the rest of the series will live up to that same standard. Let me know what you think of the video, leave me a comment, I read every single one, always try to respond to as many as I can. Uh, you can also really help me out by liking the video and sharing it around with other people who you think might be interested. The opening chapter to this series is the fastest a video of mine has ever hit 1, 5 and 10k views, and that's really down to how much engagement I've had from you guys on the platform. Thank you once again for watching, I will be back next Saturday for Chapter 5, Apocalypse.